Anyone who knows about cancer treatments knows how tough chemotherapy can be, especially for children. Can you tell us a little bit about how difficult childhood cancer is in terms of scale? What, what is the scale of issue we're dealing with here? So in, in terms of metrics, there are around 1,800 children in the UK who are diagnosed with cancer each year. So that equates to around five patients a day. Wow. In terms of the impact on families, um, it's really hard. I think unless you've actually been in that situation where a child is diagnosed with cancer, I think that's incredibly difficult to be able to explain. I know from many years of doing clinical research, it's incredible how positive these families you know, stay. We, we carry out clinical trials, we carry out some research. The, the research we're talking about here down in London this week is very much a research project where the patients benefit. But actually we do a lot of research projects where it relies on the altruism of the families. So basically they're kind of like wanting to be involved in research, even if it doesn't help their child, for potentially for future children. So the positivity of the families just always amazes me. It's always um, very inspiring. Yeah, I can't imagine that that's, <laughs> it must be one of the worst things that you absolutely, have to deal with in imagine, your life. Yeah, so um, when you're treating childhood cancers, you know, I mean, chemotherapy is tough for adults. Can you tell me a bit about the effect it has on younger bodies? Yeah, so I, th I think chemotherapy is challenging for any patient. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, you're targeting your own cells. There's a subpopulation of your cells where there is this uncontrolled cell division. So most of the drugs, or certainly the well-established drugs, they're very much designed to target cell division or DNA replication. So that's obviously going to hit your host cells. There's going to be side yeah, effects. Because all cells do that, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah, so so yeah. we know that the classic side effects of chemotherapy, like the hair loss, mm -hmm. affects your bone marrow because you're creating you know, hundreds of thousands of blood cells each day. They're the kind of acute effects. But after your chemotherapy, those effects will, you know, the hair will grow back, etc. Some of the more serious side effects, and this particularly is the case with children with well-established drugs, things like um, kidney toxicity, um, so damage to the kidneys. In very young children, sometimes hearing loss, effects on fertility. These are more long-term effects, which are then clearly going to affect the quality of life of the patient and, and more in the long term. Yeah, so a really, really tough problem to deal Absolutely. with. And I'm glad that some people like you are trying to improve that situation. Um, could you explain a little bit about how that can be improved and what is the work that you're doing? So the work that we do, we essentially look at kind of personalizing the treatment in these um, patients. So one of the reasons why it's particularly challenging in children is because if you think in the pediatric space, we're going to be dealing with babies from the first, literally the first days or weeks of life through to teenagers, 15, 16 year old teenagers. Clearly, we're going to need to dose patients differently. They're going to handle drugs differently, etc. In adults, it's a little bit more homogenous. Also in adults, there are more, some of the newer drugs, the targeted drugs are a bit kinder, a bit fewer side effects. The, the more well-established drugs that are used to treat um, children with cancer, as I say, they generally target cell division, DNA replication. So there are some of these you know, quite severe side effects that are going to affect um, those children um, throughout their life. So we essentially look at following a standard dose of drug in patients. What does that mean in terms of drug exposure? And the best way to kind of explain that, I guess, is a therapeutic drug monitoring approach. If we had patients being treated, maybe there's a baby being treated at Great Ormond Street, there might be a baby being treated in Birmingham Children's Hospital, and there may be a baby being treated in um, Newcastle Hospital. Those babies are all very similar in terms of the physical size. They may be receiving the same chemotherapy for the same tumor type. But actually, following a standard dose of chemotherapy, one of those children may have a very low exposure to the drug. And when I talk about exposure, I mean the concentration of drug that's actually in the bloodstream, okay. because that's how the drug gets around the body to the tumor cells. So that's about how much the child is actually absorbing into their so bloodstream, yeah, so absolutely. what's effective. Yeah. So it's to yeah. do with absorption, it's to do with the rate of metabolism and, and, and clearance of the drug. And in, especially in very young children, this varies a lot because, example, your kidneys are still developing in a very young child, your liver enzymes are you know, at different levels. So um, a second patient may have the kind of right exposure, by chance from the dose that's given. And then a third patient may have a much higher drug exposure and those patients are potentially more likely to get toxicity. So what we want, it's a bit like a kind of Goldilocks thing. You want that just right, not too much, not too little, because we know that if you've got too low an exposure, you're less likely to respond or you're more likely to relapse. And we know that if you get too high an exposure, you're more likely to have some of these more severe side effects. So in the UK, there are around, I think it's estimated over 40,000 childhood cancer survivors mm -hmm. over, I think between 75 and 80 percent of children now who are diagnosed with cancer will survive their treatment, but around two thirds of those children will have um, 
kind of side effects that are going to affect their quality of life. So the, the project that we have, the therapeutic drug and monitoring, we already do it as a national program. In terms of the project that we have and that we're, we're showcasing at the, um, at the exhibit this week, it's a link with um, a group of chemical engineers at the UCL and a spin-out company called Vicinta. So we're kind of marrying together our medical science um, experience and research experience with their chemical engineering experience. And the idea is to have a, a kind of a hardware device which would be available at point of care, so within the hospitals. At the moment, in order to do the dose adjustments in patients, samples have to be sent to our lab in Newcastle at Newcastle University. Right. To make it much more accessible, what we would like is to have this kind of hardware available at point of care on a hospital ward so that a doctor or a nurse can use it. And what that device is doing is measuring the child's response to the drug, like, like you mentioned. So in our um, the research laboratory at Newcastle University, we have very large, expensive machines. The majority of the drugs are analysed by a technique called liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. The machine um, that we, is being developed by UCL, by the engineers, is very similar approach in terms of chromatography. It uses an old-fashioned thin layer chromatography, but will give the required level of, level of sensitivity for measuring the drugs accurately in the samples. So what does the machine actually do once you've taken a blood sample? So the new machine will work with ideally a very limited volume of blood. With current practice, we will analyze normally one to two millilitres of blood. The new machine will work with a drop of blood, which could be taken from a finger prick or in a baby from a heel prick, and will basically be loaded onto the machine, and then it will use the chromatography techniques to allow the, um, the drug levels to be um, quantified. Did you ever think that your career would be so rewarding? Um, <laughs> No, it's, Maybe not, you it's did, not, something I ever, not something I ever really thought about, but you're absolutely right. In terms of job satisfaction, I mean, I work with a great team of people up in Newcastle, but the work that we do, we do a lot of work looking at development of new drugs, as well as this paediatric research programme. So I think we know that the vast majority of work we do is helping patients, whether that's adult patients or in this case, in children with cancer. So it's, it's absolutely rewarding. And the other, the other big thing is it it just makes you realise, it puts things in perspective. You know, we're, we're analysing clinical samples from babies who are days old being treated for cancer. And it just makes your kind of any problems you have just pale into insignificance. I think. Definitely. Um, but yeah, like I said before, again, I'm so glad that you and your team do the work that you do. It's been really inspiring talking Thank to you. you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Now we are going to see chromatography in action with Fran, who should be back in the main hall. Are you there, Fran? Hi, yes, Roma, I have found this sprout and I'm also joined by Professor Stefan Gooding from UCL. So, hello, Stefan. Hey, how are you doing? What's going on with the sprout? Well, actually, uh, we are testing the population. We want to find out who likes Brussels sprouts and we want to tell you why you like Brussels sprouts and why you don't like it. So, this is a test to easily find that out. Let's start with this one first. Okay, okay. And you mean so real Brussels sprouts, not, not Matt here? <laughs> yeah, just put it on your tongue and see what this sensation will tell okay. you. Okay. Uh -uh. You like this? What do you taste? Paper. Well, that's very good because it was just a control. This was just a small test. <laughs> now <laughs> that we go. The wrong answer. <laughs> no, 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 no. Now we go with the real test and we'll find out. Oh, okay, okay. So now, actually, there are people that taste nothing, just like with the filter paper, and others have a strong sensation. We'll find out. Let's give Let's it a go. go. Okay. Oh, that is. That is disgusting. Like, what, what is on that? So, on this, chem on this strip is actually a chemical that causes a bitterness in Brussels sprout. It's called PTC. And actually, many people here on the stall had no sensation whatsoever. It's just that your taste buds are extremely sensitive to this chemical. So, when it comes in, they lock in place and they fire a very strong sensation. So, not everyone can taste that? Not everyone can taste and it. And that's why I don't like Brussels sprouts. Exactly. No offense. But actually, it also just illustrates how it's important to um, measure drug levels because not every person responds the same way to their medication. So as they must respond to this differently to this chemical, people respond differently to the medication due to distribution, metabolism and clearance. And we need to measure this. And we found a very simple way of measuring drug levels using this principle of color separation chromatography. Absolutely. So what you can see here is um, a black ink and how it's being um, traveling up when, it, when you dip it in water. And this is because different components of the black ink, uh, they travel at different speeds across the paper. And we can do something very similar to separate the drug from the blood, because if we tune this well, our drug will be somewhere in the middle and everything else will be either ahead or below. And using some tricks, we can actually use this to determine exactly the amount of 
drug in your blood in a very simple really, way. Really, um, So using chromatography, you can know how much drug has actually got to the patient, but gosh, it's beautiful, isn't there? And there's lots of stuff going on over yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. Chromatography is not only fun, um, uh, to, to, it's not only very accurate to measure drug levels, it can be very much fun uh, and you can do beautiful art. So I sent you over to Mamta's now and you should do some stuff with her. Uh, thank you so Hi. much. Oh, look at this. Montez, this looks amazing. Hi. Nice to meet you. What is going on here? Well, I'd say this is the most colourful corner of the entire exhibition. It absolutely <laughs> is. We are trying uh, chromatography. Of course. And so we've got three different exciting things you can do with your chromatography papers. Yeah. We're actually looking at colour separation. So that's what chromatography is. And we're doing it with felt tip pens, mm -hmm. some coffee filter paper. So this is something that anyone can do at home absolutely. as well. Absolutely. And then you can actually turn it into a flower, a butterfly, or a keyring. And uh, what's really exciting is every single one. It's like it's so different, and it's like so magical and yes, brilliant. Go, right? Oh, well, this is fantastic. <laughs> so you you put the pens on, yeah. you put a little bit of water. It separates yeah. into the different colours. You know what's amazing about this? Okay, this was one line with a black felt tip pen. And like, look at how many colours you get from a black that pen. That is great. Okay, give me, give me a go. Give me right, a go, so Montaz. You're going to take your filter paper. Yeah, got it, and got it. And what we want to do, because we're going to look at colour separation, we want to leave some white gaps in there. Understood. And we want to leave the centre point empty as well. Yeah. And then you've got your felt tip pens. Yeah, okay, this I'll go for this only works with water-based pens, not permanent, so... Of course, and I just draw tip. any pattern. Yeah, the great thing is, you could write a secret message, you could write words, patterns, no one's going to know. <laughs> right. When you put it in the water... It all separate. Right, I'm just going to do a <laughs> line, I think. Um, Absolutely, a line can be very magical. A curly line, squiggly line. <laughs> Around like this. I'm just going to do one colour actually. Yeah, I'm going to okay. do it nice let's and. Say this was black, so let's see what happens with the purple. And I put it in the water? Yes. So, what you want to do is you only want to put the uh, white section in the water. Okay. You don't want the whole thing to drop in. So, okay. I just dip so it in. So, fold it a bit more into a cone shape so it's easier like to this. actually sit in there. That's right. And then just dip rest it in. in. Just rest it to the corner. Like this? To the edge. So what I normally say is, is rest one. it initially and then oh, it will yeah. just start oh, to stick in there right. and you just wait. <laughs> we don't need to fall over. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we're just going to rest it there and we'll wait and watch for the magic to happen. It takes a few minutes. Yeah. You only got the one colour so we'll just see how that actually travels up. And, and you can see, see the some water pink, rising. Some yeah. little pinks coming out of there. So we can already see that. It's totally already working. You can see it coming up. It's a bit wetter than, you know, we would have liked. Oh, that is fantastic. And it's using this method that you've made all of these beautiful things here. Yeah. Oh, Montaz, <laughs> this is, it's such a beautiful way to look at chromatography. That is such an important tool when it comes to science. Roma, it's back to you. Oh, what's going on here?